Uh, so I was asked to sort of do something that was fairly introductory, um, but which also covered things like the sectoral accounts that uh, we look at in MMT and how to interpret those. So um, I'd also like to thank Adam for some of the um, overheads, some of the graphics I'll be using as well in this talk. So to begin with, I'm going to look at what MMT is, <coughs> why we need deficit spending. Um, I want to highlight the difference between what we call sovereign and non-sovereign governments and why it matters and also touch on why we need a job guarantee. So, MMT is a branch of post-Keynesian macroeconomics. Its advocates accept Keynes's endorsement of the principles of chartalism. In a nutshell, the idea that money has value because it's needed to pay taxes. Its advocates also adhere to Abba Lerner's notion that the primary goal of macro policy should be to achieve full employment with low levels of inflation, full stop, in a sustainable way. And of course, you might want to add to that the principle of ecological sustainability. And they also argue the only institutional impediments to a return to full employment are those which are self-imposed under neoliberal misconceptions about how the economy operates. So, by way of sort of highlighting some of these principles, I'm going to introduce a short quiz, and I apologise for those who've seen this material before. And this was originally pulled together by um, uh, Randy Ray uh, from the University of Kansas, Missouri. But um, So, each of these questions can be answered either by true or false. So firstly, just like a household, the government has to finance its spending either out of its income or through borrowing. True or false? That's right. Question two. The role of taxes is to provide finance for government spending. True or false? false. Exactly. <laughs> Question three. The national government borrows money from the private sector to finance the budget deficit. True or false? false. That's right. And question four. By running budget surpluses, the government takes pressure off interest rates because more funds become available for private sector investment projects. True or false? False. false? false. Okay. Question five. Persistent budget deficits will burden future generations, both with inflation and higher taxes. False. True or false? <laughs> and finally, running budget surpluses now will help build up funds necessary to cope with the ageing population in the future and will also give jobs to Peter Costello, of course. False. Okay. So why then do we need government spending or deficit spending in this context? Well, the way MMT sort of expresses it is that governments have to deficit spend if everyone else, the non-government sector, wishes to net save. Otherwise, it will be creating unemployment and underemployment, but also precariousness in the labour market, casual and part-time employment. So, um, turns of phrase like this sort of highlight the fact that unemployment is a policy choice. If we have unemployment, it's because the government has reneged on its responsibilities to provide sufficient effective demand. The other thing about deficit spending, of course, is that it promotes growth in both income and wealth, and debt levels can increase in proportion to the level of deficit spending. On the other side of the coin, if the government is running surpluses, they will drive the non-government sector as a whole into deficit. If those deficits are sustained, they can result in financial fragility and instability. And a very good example of that is work conducted by the Bank of England using um, a stock flow consistent model uh, worked by Barwell and Burroughs who <coughs> looked at uh, national income accounts and flow of funds accounts to identify areas of burgeoning financial instability in the run-up to the global financial crisis during and in the aftermath of the global financial crisis. <coughs> 
Okay, so one way in which we can identify the problem associated with these deficits is through looking at sectoral balances. So I'll come to that in a moment. Now, I talk about financial fragility, so what is it? Well, fragility in the financial sector is associated with loss of diversification, okay, having too many eggs in one basket. We can think about examples of this if we go through the, some of the major financial crises we've had in recent history. So, the global financial crisis, where did we lose diversification? Where was all the money going? Where were we mainly investing? Assets. Sorry? The housing, wasn't it? It was in mortgages, and not just mortgages, but also a lot of those mortgages were what they call low dock mortgages in Australia and what they call subprime mortgages in America. Does anyone know what subprime mortgages or low dock mortgages are? High risk. Yeah, because basically people don't have sufficient deposits. They tend to be, um, you know, perhaps f fragile in terms of the, they might be losing their jobs and might find difficulty repaying the mortgage, that sort of thing. Or you might have a two income household that becomes a single income household. And, yeah, so low doc or subprime mortgages, an example of loss of diversification. Another financial crisis, late 80s in Australia. Where was all the money going? Non-residential construction. Office blocks popping up all over the place. You see all the cranes on the horizon as all these office blocks are going up. And there was just too much investment in that area compared to prospective demand. And that was manifest in the fact that you had all these empty offices, people couldn't find uh, clients willing to rent, and you had a lot of non-performing loans and doubtful debts. Uh, Dot-com boom. What was the example of loss of diversification during the dot-com boom? Obviously, everyone plowing their money into high technology activity, and much of it not realising any current profit, but anticipating future profits five, ten years down the track. Other aspect of fragility is uh, deferred payback. So when we talk about investment projects, we look at when the investment project transits from being in the red into being in the black. When does that occur? That's the payback point. And you can express it in sort of present value terms. And what happens when things become more fragile is more and more projects get pushed out into the future. The payback periods are deferred further and further into the future. That's fragility. Increasing reliance on external debt, that can be uh, on, the, on the part of households, or on the part of banks, or on the part of corporations, other non-financial corporations. All of them can become increasing reliant on external debt. So what do I mean by external debt? Well, for a household, it's when they're borrowing, instead of relying on their own wage income or um, other sources of income. What about for firms? Well, external debt for firms is where they use all their retained earnings and then have to go to other sources of finance, which could be the share market or they could borrow long term in the banking sector. As a result of growing fragility, you get instability. One expression of that is increasing uncertainty as the economy becomes more fragile. You can also see increasing uh, non-performing loans or doubtful debts, and that can lead to asset price deflation, which then has further consequences. So we know in Australia that the downturn in housing prices in Victoria and New South Wales really knocked the stuffing out of the local economy for a while, and we're still seeing the effects of that. Okay, of course, what also occurred <coughs> during the global financial crisis is securitization. So people talk about um, uh, collateralized debt obligations, CDOs, and CDSs, credit default swaps. So they're just technical terms for what? Well, you take a whole bunch of mortgages, you combine very high risk mortgages with less risky mortgages, you bundle them up and then sell chunks of the bundle. Uh, that's securitization. You can provide insurance on those assets that have been securitized and their credit default swaps or the 
credit of Elswap specifically refer to transactions in uh, fixed interest securities. So let's make it a little bit more concrete. During the global financial crisis in America, of course, the main securitization was of these low dock or subprime mortgages, as they're called. Subprime mortgages combined with less risky mortgages sold as AAA rated assets. So all the ratings agencies were compromised because they were working very closely with the banks and they were giving these securitized assets AAA ratings uh, when they were very far from AAA. So what happens? It corrodes the whole underwriting procedure and the ratings agencies were complicit in the process. But as MMT advocates, we say, well, well securitization is really a, a bit of an epiphenomena and there are deeper processes going on that explain the global financial crisis. So these deeper causes include fiscal austerity, the fact that governments have been reneging on their responsibility to deficit spend, to achieve full employment, and to invest in desired infrastructure. And also, globally, we're ex experiencing this phenomena of real wage repression, where wages are not keeping up with productivity growth, and what that means is that the wage share of income is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So, let's come back to this distinction between sovereign and non-sovereign governments. Why is it important? Well, if governments issue their own currency, they're not revenue constrained. They don't need to finance their own spending. They keystroke their currency into existence as an electronic transaction. So why does that money, that virtual money, if you like, have value? The chartalist answer to that is, as we've seen, because people need it to pay their tax obligations. And that raises the next obvious question, well, how do people acquire the money in the first place to pay their tax obligations? And the answer to that is, the government makes that money available when they use it to purchase goods and services from the non-government sector. Now that's why the overall level of tax revenue is important in an economy because it explains the degree of disposition the government has over the goods and services produced by the non-government sector. Okay. You can still deficit spend, but you deficit spend from a base that's determined by the overall level of taxation in the economy. So if you want to have a government that disposes over a large proportion of the goods and services produced by the private sector, then you need to have a big tax take. If you compare Australia, of course, we're on the bottom end of the OECD in terms of the amount of tax revenue we take out of the economy. We're on a par with Turkey and America, right at the bottom compared to countries like, or the Scandin Scandinavian countries like Norway and Sweden, of course, that have a very high tax take. Okay. So the volume of tax revenue reflects the command of the government over those resources, and also means the governments can readily deficit spend when they need to boost demand. Yeah. Exactly what's meant by government deficit and its corresponding uh, services. The, the corresponding between the private sector deficit. What precisely does this mean? Right. I think I know what it means, but it's not. Yeah. Actually, what I'll do is when we get to the analysis of the sectoral accounts, I explain those concepts oh, in detail. Okay. So if you just sort of, I mean, I just want to give you the, an overall view at the moment of Charles principles, <coughs> and then we'll look at sectoral accounts and we'll clarify those definitions, if that's all right. Okay, so I mean basically a deficit is where the government spends more than it taxes, and a private sector deficit is where the private sector as a whole invests more than they save. Okay, so, government bonds are issued or purchased by the central bank to achieve 
its target rate of interest. So the main policy instrument that governments pursue uh, from a monetary policy perspective is they target what's called the overnight rate of interest or the interbank rate at which banks borrow and lend between one another. And they issue government bonds, they buy or sell them to achieve that target in a way that I'll explain. <coughs> and the issue here is that if you have sovereignty, <coughs> the governments can always meet the debt obligations by paying interest in their own currency. So you'll find central bankers who will say governments can never go broke because of increasing debt because they can also always meet those obligations as issuers of the currency in which those debts are denominated. So one of the issues in sovereignty is whether your foreign debt or your, your obligations to the rest of the world or to the private sector, whether your debt is denominated in your own currency or in a foreign currency. Because if you have a large proportion of your debt denominated in, say, US dollars rather than Australian dollars, that can be problematic. It reduces your sovereignty. Okay, so part of the definition of sovereignty is also <coughs> having your debt denominated in your own currency. James, as a corollary, could we also say that, you, that we, our exchange rate needs to be free floating as well? Very much so, yeah. Sovereignty means that you issue your own currency, a fiat currency, um, which shouldn't be pegged to other currencies. And, of course, countries within the European Union do not have their own currency. They use the euro as the currency if they're in the monetary union. And that comes with all sorts of strings attached to it. And some of those strings are controls over your deficit to GDP ratios or your debt to GDP ratios. So poor old Greece, when it was struggling through the global financial crisis, could not deficit spend to boost employment because the European Central Bank was staring over their shoulder and imposing these constraints that prevented them from increasing their deficit. So, <clears throat> governments within the European Monetary Union, and also in Australia, state and local governments, are revenue constrained. That means they have to borrow or tax to spend, and always have to be concerned about the levels of debt they're creating. So, when I worked in the 1980s for the Department of State Development and Technology in South Australia, one of the things that everyone used to get nervous about was when the ratings agencies, Standard & Poor and Moody's, would assess the government's financial position and rate government debt. Was it triple A? Was it double A? Was it A plus? And even a slight change in those ratings would supposedly increase the interest rate that governments had to pay on their cumulative debt. So, the Premier and Treasury officials used to monitor the credit ratings agencies very, very carefully and get very nervous when it came to ratings time. Okay, so this is a concern. And of course, one of the problems is if you're governed at a federal level by someone who's had experience at the state level, they often are much more obsessed about debt than they need to be because state governments are revenue constrained. Okay. So, I mentioned that the global financial crisis wasn't just a product of securitization. So, in the mainstream, they focus on subprime lending, this expansion of securitized assets, and the fact that the companies providing insurance, like AIG, had inadequate models of the risk associated with those securitized assets they were providing insurance for. And of course we saw AIG had moved out of America to the UK because post Maggie Thatcher, the UK had very sloppy financial regulations, made it easier for AIG to operate. 
but they were one of the first casualties of the global financial crisis. They went bankrupt. So the agency that was providing insurance for all the securitized assets was one of the first casualties. Okay, in opposition to that sort of mainstream analysis, <coughs> post Keynesians emphasize first and foremost growing inequality of income and wealth. In part, that's due to globalization, but also this sort of worldwide embrace of neoliberal policy regimes over the 1980s and 90s. You had Maggie Thatcher, of course, in the UK. In the 80s, you had Ronald Reagan in the US. And where did all this neoliberal stuff come from? Well, a lot of it was cooked up by Austrian economists in Vienna in uh, the 1920s and 30s. Uh, but no one took that much interest or much notice of it. Um, one of the Vienna trained economists, Walter Eucken, became Chancellor of the Exchequer in Germany after the Second World War and started imposing neoliberal policies there. A lot of the Austrians moved to Chicago during the war, the Second World War, and Chicago became a bastion of this sort of Austrian economics. And uh, of course in Australia, the first neoliberal budget was that of probably Bill Hayden, the Queensland cop who became the treasurer and uh, laid down the, the last budget of the Whitlam government in 1975. And that effectively was when we abandoned full employment in Australia. Okay. Sorry, sorry. Hmm, yeah. In what way, like in that budget, what, what did they do that, that, was, that, that was a shift to a neoliberal um, Yeah, no, that's a good question. Well, they started raising interest rates. Remember, we had the first oil shock in the early 70s, and people were worried about inflation. Um, I, it wasn't as bad as it would get under Malcolm Fraser, but effectively they allowed, they, rather than deficit spending, they allowed unemployment to rise. And what happened of course with Malcolm Fraser is um, Philip Lynch, who became treasurer in the Fraser government, together with one of the media magnates, they brought Milton Friedman over, jet fresh from Chile, where he'd been ad advising the new Pinochet dictatorship, and uh, he began to give talks about the dangers of letting the inflation genie out of the bottle, any of you could remember, and we had our first wage pauses, and of course Friedman would talk about how government policy would have long and variable lags which made it difficult to implement, and uh, yeah, we had to fight inflation first. So. That was really, and it, it wasn't just in Australia, it was happening in many, many economies at around about the same time. But, sorry, James, hmm. sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Was that influenced by the fact that we didn't have a floating exchange rate at that time? Yes, because so that didn't, of course, that wasn't implemented until um, you know, the Keating, the whole Keating government came into power. Mm -hmm. And they had, of course, the uh, Campbell inquiry under Malcolm Fraser, which well, I mean, I can go into this, if you like, very quickly, but we had a choice under the Campbell Inquiry. The non-bank financial institutions had been growing rapidly at the expense of the traditional banks, but the traditional banks had lender of last resort support from the government, because the government would guarantee if there was a bank run, the government would guarantee, don't worry, there's plenty of money in the bank, we'll guarantee it. So they had the opportunity either to regulate the non-bank financial institutions or deregulate the banks so they could compete more effectively with the non-bank financial institutions. Of course, a lot of those non-bank institutions were owned by banks anyway. But of course, what the Campbell report said was, well, we should float the dollar and we should deregulate the banks. Uh, and the Martin inquiry was implemented by the Labor government to rubber stamp the Campbell inquiry. Uh, and of course, floating the dollar was a good thing. The problem was that people weren't used to the implications of having a floating dollar, all right? And uh, it took a long time for people to wake up to the fact that if we had a floating exchange rate, we didn't need to worry about what was going on with our debt, our foreign debt. Now, during the Hawke Keating years, you, know, you might have remembered Johnny Howard was driving around with a truck that had a graph of foreign debt painted on it going up through the roof of the van and everyone was jumping up and down complaining about foreign debt. I was at a meeting as a proxy for the um, state president of the ALP, God forbid, in Sydney at Sussex Street 
in the late 80s. And it was when all the public sector unions were presenting their case for against privatisation. And Keating was the treasurer, he had Don Russell there whispering in his ear. And the public sector unions were saying, well, we should be funding all this infrastructure, we shouldn't be worried about privatising the Commonwealth Bank or Qantas. And Keating basically hammered them for half an hour, or me included. And what was he saying? He was talking about foreign debt. <coughs> and if we were paying $18 billion in interest payments every year on all this foreign debt, how could we sustain that? You know? And that was what the trade union movement were hammered with all through you know, the 80s into the 90s. And we sort of forget that the economic discourse of the day was really all about the impossibility of building up all this foreign debt. And nowadays, no one talks about it. No one ever talks about foreign debt. It's just a dead issue. But at the time, it was what was used to sort of smash the unions and convince people like Laurie Carmichael, you know, that they should fix the problem of the real wage overhang. You know, the fact that <coughs> wages were too high and we needed to shift more income to profit away from wages. Yes, and of course that was just an accord between the trade union movement and the Hawke-Keating government. It didn't include the employers, and that was problematic too, because they were the sort of... Actually, he had been influenced by the British Labour Party because monetarism had really took over. Uh, you know, it was in its early stages over there, but it had really got a foothold. Yeah. And he was starting to think, we, we don't want to be going and doing something out on our own. We want to follow the sound finance. The sand finance meant you know, uh, that you fight inflation first, and so, mm. and also the foreign debt thing. And so, mm. I, I think he, if he uh, if he'd been the treasurer in another era, after we closed the dollar, it might be a different situation. Yeah. Perhaps, yeah. I mean, they got rid of Jim Cairns, of course, and that was the Junie Moroni affair, and then you had the the Kemlani scandal where the Whitlam government were trying to get massive amounts of borrow large amounts of money from dodgy um, sources. That's right. And of course they were linked in with the CIA, we all know that story. Anyway, look, <clears throat> what we've got here, thanks to Adam, is a graph of um, US household income growth that separates income into different percentiles. So you've got the 10th percentile here, the 50th or the meridian, the 90th, 95th. And everyone should you know, have a copy of this diagram pinned to their wall. You know, to look at what's happened over this long period of time, because here, the bottom 50% are really flatlining, and it's only these two sort of income groups, if not the 95th, that are really sort of growing, the top 10%, and of course even more so the top 1%. But uh, here, yeah, people are just flatlining in terms of growth in income. This is uh, a similar diagram for um, growth in US net wealth. And uh, what we're seeing here is quite dramatic growth in, on the part of domestic corporations, but also households and non-profits. And um, general government has been growing, but just marginally from a pretty low base. And US claims on the rest of the world have been expanding as well. But it's really these two areas that uh, have seen um, US net wealth increasing. And of course, if you compare that chart against the previous one, then a lot of that wealth would be distributed very unequally as well, uh, given the income flows that go into it. Meanwhile, the tax burden, compared with the 60s, Low earners are paying an increasing share of their income in federal taxes. Those in the middle have been paying somewhat more, but we're seeing really a lot of this sort of contraction uh, of tax payment on the part of uh, the wealthy. So it's pretty clear from these graphs sort of what's going on in terms of income and wealth inequality, both before tax and after. And in terms of net uh, wealth, the top 10% of families own 51 trillion in wealth, or about 75% of total household wealth at least at 2013. Okay, now this is another of um, Adam's diagrams, and this is based on work by 
Steve Keane. What Steve is looking at... Um, Biggs. Well, it's Mayor Biggs and so on, but it was originally Steve was the original... Um, no, 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 it was no, these no, people, wasn't it? He picked it up from there. Oh, okay, okay. So, now, what's going on here? Look at the blue line. That's a combination of real consumption and investment. So it's spending in the economy on the part of households and firms. The grey line is what's called the credit impulse as a percentage of GDP. So the credit impulse is the rate of change or the rate of change of credit. It's acceleration or deceleration in the provision of credit. And what we can see here is that it's very closely correlated with changes in expenditure. So it really shows you now the sort of link between spending on the part of uh, households and firms and credit provision through the banking system. Um, sorry, so going back to that first one, which, yes. which, which is the driver? Which, which is the chicken and which, is the, which comes first? That's a very good question. Uh, of course, the way this data is usually interpreted is that the driver is the credit provision. I mean, one way of thinking about that, I guess, is that during periods when banks get nervous and start rationing credit, it's going to have big effects, okay? And of course that began to occur with the global financial crisis which we're seeing at the end of the data series here. Um, but of course the, another way of thinking about it is that credit provision is really uh, endogenous, it's passive. So if there are plenty of people willing to borrow, banks are going to step in and make credit available to them. They'll try to distinguish between worthy and unworthy borrowers, but in the main, credit provision will sort of be stimulated by the level of spending and economic activity. They feed back into one another because, because of people's... Sorry? They, they feed back into one another because of people's perceptions and their confidence levels. And well, that's true too. Yes. If, if I can comment on this, basically there's a theory of Slavian super multiplier and uh, it has been recently developed by uh, Mark Lavois. It's uh, uh, basically, they say that it is, it is uh, these are the changes in uh, debt finance spending by households, uh, mainly on, on housing, what drives changing in the economic cycle. It flows through the basically spending, multipli uh, spending multiplier. So if we get 1% increase in uh, spending, it will result in pretty much 1.5, 1.6% increase in GDP, which can be seen on this uh, graph, because if you look at the changes in credit impulse and uh, changes in real investment and uh, consumption, these are different scales, and it's basically, it, you will see it, it is kind of amplified. So, so this can be explained in pretty simple terms, using very using this uh, simple Keynesian spending multiplier uh, mechanism. Um, you're talking about, Mark, uh, Lavoie, the, the post-Keynesian Canadian economist. Yes. Mm -hmm. You must get that paper. You sh show me that paper. Yeah. Okay. I mean, what this shows here is the correlation between household spending, that's debt finance, and the unemployment rate. And I guess what's coming through here is really the sensitivity of unemployment to what's going on with aggregate demand. So, you know, it's simply saying demand matters. It's not a supply-driven phenomena. Unemployment is very much driven by demand. These shaded periods, of course, are the recession periods, and you can see contractions uh, in household uh, debt levels that are amplified once again by changes in the unemployment rate, or mirrored by changes in the unemployment rate. Okay. Let's turn now to sectoral balances because this brings us back to the question of um, sustainability or unsustainability. What happens when governments choose to renege on their obligation to deficit spend when there is unemployment? What happens when they run surpluses like SCOMO is trying to do at the moment? What are the implications of that? for the sustainability of what goes on in the private sector. So, what we have here are three accounting identities. And uh, the simple truth is that if one sector is going to run a surplus, at least one other sector has to run a deficit. And in order for one sector to accumulate wealth, <coughs> at least one other sector has to be in deficit. 
it's impossible for all three sectors, government, uh, private sector, and rest of the world, to accumulate that financial wealth by running surpluses. So this is probably a little bit more familiar. This is the private domestic financial balance, private sector saving, net of investment, and that has to also equal net acquisition of financial assets in the economy. And that has to equal the sum of the government deficit, government spending G minus tax revenue, and the current account balance or surplus here. So, if we put to one side what's going on with the current account balance, let's assume this is neutral, then there has to be a mirror image between <coughs> what's going on in the domestic private sector and what's going on with the government. So government deficit spending, if spending is greater than tax revenue, is going to be matched by domestic private sector saving being greater than investment. If instead the government decides to run a surplus, then in the domestic private sector, we're going to see a deficit. Investment spending will be greater than savings. Okay. Of course, we also have what's going on on the current account balance. Now, what goes on in the rest of the world tends to be driven by seasonal factors. It tends to be driven by fairly lumpy factors, like when Qantas decides to buy a whole lot of new Boeings or scrap the Boeings and buy something that actually stays up in the air. And it's also determined by longer term trends. So when we actually plot sectoral balances, most of the movement is in these two components, or they appear to be sort of like mirror images of one another on the graph, as we'll see in a moment. Now, another way of rephrasing this is that the government sector deficit is equal to the non-government surplus or deficit and deficits create financial wealth. So this is a flow of funds approach. It's based on accounting principles and rather being a, a behavioral framework for explaining these flows. So if you want to explain really what's going on in the whole economy, you need to do some modeling and account for those behavioral phenomena. But sectoral balances are quite helpful. So flow of funds accounts are a system of social accounting where you divide the economy into a number of sectors and for the moment we're dealing with three government, private sector, rest of the world but you can decompose those for example a lot of stock flow consistent models people introduce the banking sector or the financial sector you have government, households, banks and firms you also then construct what's called a sources and uses of funds statement for each of the sectors. And when you place them all side by side, what we get is a flow of funds matrix for the economy as a whole. Okay, so a good exposition here, going right back to 1963, is in the Journal of Finance. The funds that a particular sector receives during a period from current receipts, borrowing, selling financial assets, and running down cash balances, have to be equal to the total of its current expenditures, capital expenditures, any repayments of debt, any lending, and accumulation of cash balances. So this is the sort of statement of all the components in that flow of funds account. And when a sector has a financial surplus, in other words, when its income exceeds its expenditure, it is able to add to its net financial assets, either through additional purchases of new assets, or by reducing the existing debt obligations. So that's why flow of funds accounts are so helpful, and that's why the Bank of England has been putting so much uh, investment into developing models that can account for all of these sort of flows of funds. Once again, if one sector has improved its net acquisition of financial assets, in other words, achieved a financial surplus, at least one other sector must have reduced its net financial assets or run a financial deficit. And that's the key point, because if this is the government, this could be the domestic private sector, or the rest of the world. <coughs> so this is some 
described in one of Bill's um, blogs here, and there's a, a link for anyone who's interested in looking at the detail of that whole blog. This is a very schematic example of a sort of current transactions table. So what have we got here? Well, we've combined uh, the private sector and the banks into just one sector here, production. We've got government and we've got a foreign sector. And we've also got income and expenditure. And we break up components into private expenditure, export, government spending, imports, GDP, taxes, and financial balances. Okay, so what we've got here is a sort of transactions table with the foreign sector appearing. And what it shows is that imports minus exports and transfers paid by the external sector have to equal the balance of payments deficit. If you look at the GDP accounts, okay, basically they're comprised of private expenditure up here, plus government expenditure, plus exports net of imports, and every item in that production column is matched by a corresponding negative entry in some other column. So taxes net of transfers are received by the government, but net property income taxes and transfers are paid respectively by the external and by the private sectors. Now the crucial thing here is this final row. Because what that tells you is public sector net borrowing equals the private net acquisition of financial assets, net uh, asset creation. Private savings less investment minus the balance of payment surplus or plus the deficit BP. So once again, it's crucial to realise that the deficit plays a fundamental role here in determining the creation of net financial assets. So remember that phrase on one of the previous overheads. We get unemployment if the government doesn't deficit spend to a sufficient level to create the net savings desired by the domestic private sector. That's really saying the same thing, but ignoring what's going on in the rest of the world, the foreign sector. Copy, the two slides you just put up now, they're excellent. All right. I think that, uh, you know, they've explained a lot of things to me. Oh, good. All right. In the space of five minutes, which I haven't seen before. I've been talking to another colleague, I was trying to explain it to him, and I think yeah. he's explaining it to him now. Oh, good. Form, would, uh, I get appropriate well, sir, I'll pass them on so that uh, we've got a copy available for everyone. Yeah. Not a problem. Hmm. Now, <clears throat> this is again from that uh, Bill's blog, and it just shows uh, the sectoral balances in Australia. And uh, if you look first of all, this is the private domestic balance. The fiscal balance is in blue, and of course what you do is you look at zero as the benchmark and look at whether it's above the zero or below it. So this is all deficit, this is moving to surplus. Um, and we've got the private domestic balance here shown in red. And what this does show you is, I mean, the external balance has been sort of trending uh, towards a sort of neutral position and then sort of blown out of it. Uh, the crucial thing is this sort of concertina action between what's going on with the government in blue and what's going on with the private domestic sector in red. And this is you know, the concern that MMT sort of advocates always have with these obsessions with moving to surplus. Because when you move to surplus, the danger is that uh, you're going to create net private sector uh, debt obligations which are not going to be sustainable. Uh, this picture of sectoral balances was used when Bill was explaining the likely consequences of the, uh, the last budget that we had. And um, he warned that you know, with economic growth regularly around zero, 
unemployment is still stuck around 5.2%, and of course it just recently went up again, and underemployment around 8.5%. So, by the same token, Australian households are carrying record levels of debt, and he was, uh, the budget was framed at a time when real estate prices were plunging in Victoria and New South Wales. So he's referring to the year prior to the budget. And Australia's participation rate was below pre-global financial crisis levels, as was the employment to population ratio. Uh, the proposed flattening of the tax structure obviously is going to deliver benefits to high income cohorts but lower income workers will get very little benefit. Our external sector remains in deficit as it has been since the 1970s, running at around 3.5% of GDP. So if the government runs a fiscal surplus or a deficit below 3.5% of GDP, the private domestic sector has to be spending more than it receives overall. So this raises the issue of sustainability. Um, the bushfire crisis, well, it's not actually going to boost GDP. Um, for those who are interested, the um, Reserve Bank of Australia released its February, uh, its monetary policy statement, and there's quite a lot of detail there and forecasts of the consequences of the bushfire. It's mainly losses in agriculture that are going to be because of the drought and also the fire damage. For example, the vines, as we know in the Hunter, have been damaged by smoke and uh, they're not going to be able to sell them for wine production. Uh, so, yeah, the overall result will be a, I think they're estimating a 0.2% decline in GDP. Of course, that might give the Liberal National Party an excuse to depart from their budget surplus mantra. Uh, of course, we've got a Royal Commission at the moment into the bushfire crisis, and presumably they're hoping that by the time the Commission reports in six months' time, everyone will have forgotten about the bushfires because the drought will be over. And, uh, but it could also be a game changer for climate change, especially if enough you know, activist sort of interest builds up. So what sort of insights can be uh, drawn from MNT into the uh, climate change crisis and so on? Well, what is being emphasised in the green transition and sort of Green New Deal policies is that we really will require resource mobilisation on a grand scale. Um, Stephanie Kelton, Randy Ray, and uh, Alexandria Ocasio, uh, sorry, Ocasio Cortez have emphasised. Uh, you know, Keynes wrote this famous essay on how to pay for the war, in which he talked about the use of war bonds to uh, suppress consumption, but how they should be distributed widely to promote savings so that. Uh, when those bonds are redeemed, it benefits not just the rich or the wealthy, but also the poor. And that um, the resources that are freed up in the process can be used in public in investment. And you can also look at community banking as a, a means for promoting uh, re renewable energy and, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and of course that raises questions about technological innovation, which is one of my sort of areas of interest. And um, before I go into that, I've got a little bit here on uh, what the Reserve Bank have been saying. The soft patch in growth is likely to extend into early 2020 because of the ongoing drought, the bushfires, and of course the coronavirus. GDP growth is expected to improve over the course of this year and the next. Expected to be about two and three quarter percent uh, over 2020 and around three percent. Part of it reflects the transmission of these very low levels of interest rates that we've got. They're expecting a turnaround in mining investment. And the recovery effort following bushfires is likely to reverse the negative near term economic effect of the fires on aggregate activity, but drought conditions are likely to continue to weigh on production and exports. They acknowledge housing prices have turned around, especially in Sydney and Melbourne. Housing turnover, which is an important driver of some types of household spending, has increased, as has new borrowing, particularly by owner-occupiers. So this is all sort of fairly conventional fare, but um, yeah, things are sort of on the improve. Now, well, let's... 
seem consistent with the data they provided. Yeah, yes. they're, they're, yeah. they're conclusions. Uh, <coughs> I, I read, I read the entire uh, uh, discussion with the yeah. committee, and I think uh, Philip Lowe. Maybe we can cut his head off and stick it on a little pole, right? <laughs> and uh, it's rubbish, right? It's absolutely <laughs> rubbish. Well, he did get sort of right down the coals by Friesenberg, didn't he? It is contradictory, it is contradictory yeah. right? Uh, the, the data is unbelievable. The, 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 um, the, um, the conclusions that they draw, and uh, Tim Wilson, he asked some, at, at some point some good questions, mm -hmm. but he never followed through, particularly when he was talking about housing, right? He actually asked Philip Lowe, for anyone who hasn't read this, mm -hmm. whether the low interest rates over the last three years had any effect on uh, high housing prices. So we all know the answer, but for Philip Lowe, there was no effect from low interest rates on housing. This is the guy who's the governor of the RBA, right? Incompetent. Worse than. Worse than. And unfortunately, unfortunately, when the committee was looking into this, they really were not critical, properly critical, of what he was saying. And, and all of the myriad of inconsistencies, right? Anyway, I could go on, but it's, it's, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Well, I mean, he got, he got fried for saying that maybe we should think about fiscal policy. And he also got fried talking about how wages are too low and, uh, you know, the wage share is appalling in Australia. You know, he got dragged into the Treasurer's office and reprimanded. So I think he's sort of a bit like a poor old Newton ABC at the moment. Uh, he's not saying very much. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm just wondering, do you think that the lack of fiscal deficit is partially responsible for interest rates being so low globally because of the effect on the money supply? Well, I mean, from an MMT perspective, governments can always fix the interest rate at a level they think is suitable. Um, so I don't think uh, that's driving low interest rates. Governments have also, I mean, it's, it's monetary policy. They're saying, well, we, we, won't in, we won't engage in fiscal policy, but we'll try to keep interest rates as low as possible. A lot of agencies like the IMF are even talking now about negative interest rates, which is quite mad. What that means is if you deposit money in the bank, you have to pay the bank to look after your money. But the amount you pay them is less than borrowers uh, uh, receive. Okay? So there's still an interest rate gap between lending and borrowing. But in each case, the depositors have to pay money and the lenders actually receive the money you know, subsidised. So the problem with negative real interest rates is you've got to provide incentive for people to deposit their money in banks. How are negative interest rates different from high inflation? From high inflation? <laughs> <laughs> well, high inflation has other effects, I think. But um, let's just sort of come back. One of the things they have to do is impose it, um, constraints on transactions. So in Australia, they've just introduced legislation. Any expenditure above $10,000 has to be through electronic transaction. It cannot be through cash. So you can't use cash for large value transactions. Now, in part, that is driven by the desire to monitor and engage in surveillance of uh, activities in Australia. But also, I think it might be just in case they might have to contemplate moving to negative rates. But the general consensus is that it will create other distortions in the economy that are going to be too severe. But it will kill the cocaine market. Hmm? It, it will kill the cocaine market. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about that either. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, transaction bans will, yes. Yeah, 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 the further yeah. comment on this is basically they think mm -hmm. that if they lower the interest rate, then the economy will be sti stimulated. So, so the answer might be that because the economy is not stimulated by fiscal deficits high enough to uh, eat away all the slack, yeah. they have to drive interest rates down. Yeah. But this is not how it really works because because the impact of, of, of I mean, real interest rate is probably negative, slightly negative now. Mm. Because, uh, I, I mean, it is already up zero. Yeah. But, but changes within one or two percentage points do not change much. If they crank up nominal interest rate, 
there is a certain level of so-called held interest rate, and then, yes, it has very severe impact. But we are not talking about this rate. A negative interest rate, it will just cause capital outflow. Basically, people will start buying gold instead of instead of using cash. And so you, they cannot ban possessing gold. If they can, if they, okay, if they ban possessing gold, there will be other ways of doing this. We can look at Russia, we can look at Iran, and other countries. And basically, they screwed up the, the, the monetary system by, by doing by policies like this. But, but the, the, point, the point is that basically, they can try, they, they might stimulate the economy by uh, rekindling re re the <coughs> housing bubble. However, the question is how far it can go mm. because the stock flow ratio is quite important. The, the, the average size of mortgage compared to disposable income keeps growing. And this thing is precisely an element of Nisian cycle of, of this financial instability because we are telling not only people becoming richer because their housing assets are more and more and more expensive, but also there's, uh, there's a growing number of people who are becoming more and more net debt in terms of financial assets. Of debt, private asset of debt increasing. Yeah, and this is, precise, this is precisely that cycle which, which James was talking about uh, at the very beginning, that we, we, have a, we, have, we have a feedback effect. At some point of time, people will still, will, may, may have, some people will have very high nominal wealth, right? But there will be a population of people who will not be able to service mortgages even with low interest rates. Some, yes, yeah, some, no, they will not be, no, you will have, have to pay positive interest on your mortgage because negative is the interbank. Yeah. All right? Rate right on the interbank uh, market, which can be, let's say, minus 1%, but you will still have to pay, let's say, 1% per annum. So Adam, as James was saying, this, you, you, you can only go so far with monetary policy and you need to use fiscal policy. Yeah. This is yeah. precisely the point. This yeah. is precisely the point. And I sort of want to um, move on a little bit further and just look at this issue of innovation in the context of, um, well, the green transition. Because innovation is not something people talk about very much, but in the same way that governments have a responsibility for full employment, they can also manage the innovation process. So. I want to talk about uh, Mariana Mazzucato, who was um, mentioned by a number of people at the Adelaide Sustainable Prosperity Conference. So she wrote a book called The Entrepreneurial State, and she drew on Carl Polanyi, who um, emphasised the fact that you know, markets don't fall out of the sky fully fledged. Not only does government create fiat currency, governments also constitute markets. I mean, there have been exceptions to that rule. There have been private credit systems that have spun, um, sprung up autonomously, but in the main they tend to ride on the coattails of existing money forms. But markets, you know, in mainstream theory you tend to think first you have markets, then you have markets failing in different ways, and then governments step in and they crack the market failure. But the reality is that governments constitute markets. And so Polanyi highlights the role of the state in that constitution, how they enforce tribute and tax, how they regulate credit markets, even um, including things like debt forgiveness uh, procedures, how they coordinate international exchange. And in that context, Mariana <coughs> moves on to look at, um, well, Randy Ray and uh, Mazzucato wrote a very interesting paper with a long title. It's called a Keynes Schumpeter Minsky Synthesis. And what um, they're trying to do in that paper is link together the work of Schumpeter, Heinemann Minsky, and of course Keynes. To what end is really the issue here. Uh, so I've got a little bit of a blurb here on Schumpeter. I mean, he admired the aristocrats because they were trained to defend their class interests at the point of a sword. You know, he came from Austria where people famously used to go around with monocles and, well, the men used to proudly display their dueling scars, you know. That kind of sort of, well, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, as we know. But um, he was interested in evolutionary economics, as he calls it, um, what he used to call the process of creative destruction, where um, um, new firms would ring out the old, introduce new ways of doing things, and would become successful at the expense of the old-fashioned firms. But as capitalism sort of matured, he realised 
forlornly that um, large industrial research and development laboratories could take on a lot of this entrepreneurial role uh, and be successful in promoting innovation. So capitalism has sadly lost a lot of its heroic vigour that Schumpeter admired. Um, Minsky, of course, we've seen highlighted financial fragility and uncertainty. And um, so I won't spend too much time on this. But what happens when you bring that together with Keynes? Well, <coughs> there's this notion that we're going through a process of financialization. What that's defined by is a growing share of profit and value added on the part of the financial system compared to non-financial corporations. We're seeing increasingly speculative and short-term or myopic investment. It's supporting more trade in financial assets than production. And in that context, Mariana Mazzucato and Randy Ray are arguing, well, let's look at successful economies and the role of state investment banks. And they list a whole series of them here including the China Development Bank. They point out that not only do these investment banks have a counter-cyclical role, so they invest when the economy is down uh, and invest less when it's booming. They also have involvement in capital development, infrastructure funding, and in new venture support. They, they take on the role of venture capitalists. And they also have what she calls a challenge role. So she introduces this notion of mission-oriented finance. And what's her model here? Well, her model is America during the space race when Eisenhower said, well, you know, we've got to put a man on the moon before the Ruskies do. And what happened was he created NASA, the space agency. He got all the military defense funding under one umbrella, DARPA, plus the Office of Naval Research. And it was all driven by this determination to knock off the Russians in the context of the Cold War. Now, that can't be a good thing. So how is Mariana Mazzucato sort of using this model? Well, she's talking about mission-oriented finance for the environmental industries and agencies. And this is a model of the what's called the innovation chain, where you have research flowing into concept, invention, then early stage technology development and then product development and production and marketing. And she talks about the raft of government agencies that feed in at different points in this chain uh, where the dashed lines are weaker and the bold lines are stronger. And so you can see that different institutions influence activities at different stages in the chain. And I won't bore you with the details, but clearly agencies like DARPA and the National Science Foundation have a key role in promoting research and concept invention. And if you think about that in the context of green technologies, you can see that it could be a major sort of driver. If you go to China, you know, the Academy of Science in China and the Academy of Social Sciences uh, is an, very much driven by the planning process in China to develop a range of environmental technologies New technologies, of course, for public transport, like their uh, network of very fast trains that travel at 310 kilometers per hour. It's the largest network now in, uh, in the world. I was in Nanjing Station, which is the largest station in the Southern Hemisphere, or in Asia, I think. Uh, quite remarkable. And um, subsequently, uh, other agencies feed through into later stages in the product development cycle. Parallel to the Marshall Plan, sort of The Marshall Plan, yeah, I mean, it was really all about reconstruction and getting war-torn economies back on their feet, but also it was part of the Cold War containment, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, you know, China, Russia was no longer the, you know, the ally, it was the competitor, so you had to contain both China and Russia. So I think, I mean, some of the Marshall Plan, I mean, Keynes really got very sick involved in all those post-war negotiations over Bretton Woods and you know, the Marshall Plan, and uh, there are pros and cons to what came out of it. We know America played hardball. Uh, Dexter White, you know, who was the American representative, insisted on the US dollar being the international trading currency, whereas Keynes wanted uh, a different system entirely. You wanted Bancor. Yeah, yeah. Bancor. Bancor. That's right. Anyway, so what have we got? 
and of course Bretton Woods collapsed under Richard Nixon. Anyway, conclusions. I've emphasised the MMT take on the role of national governments. We've looked at the underlying causes of the global financial crisis. We've examined sectoral balances to identify the sources of instability and this obsession, of course, with generating surpluses. We've briefly reviewed the post-budget outlook, including the impact of the bushfires and highlighted the important role of government, including in the green transition, not just around infrastructure, but also technological innovation. And uh, that's why I'll leave it if anyone's got any comments or questions. So thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, the general, when we talk about fiscal withdrawal or fiscal conservatism, it basically means, yeah, no fiscal policy, monetary policy has to carry all the weight of trying to get the economy moving again. Now, it can be understood in a narrow sense of controlling the overnight rate of interest, or more broadly, governments can try and control the whole yield curve, which is both short-run rates and longer-run rates, like 10-year bonds, 20-year bonds. And, you know, the Bank of Japan... Uh, uh, the head of the Bank of Japan recently said, look, in Japan we can control the yield curves, and you may think we can't. So we can control both short interest rates and long rates through our bond sales and... Uh, does, does yield curve refer to the yields of bonds of different maturities? Yeah, the yield curve is basically the relationship between bonds of short duration and bonds of longer term. So it's the horizon. So until the bond is redeemed. There's no reason central banks can't be buying and selling bonds of every... They do. They, do. they, they try to, they pretend not to, but they do it. Right. And there was uh, something which was commented on Bill's blog. It, uh, it was uh, uh, Operation Twist in the, in the 60s, uh, when they fiddled uh, in, in the US uh, with uh, uh, basic good yield cap. So the Fed that was doing this, and recently they were also doing this. Mm. So, so, so it has been documented that as... Uh, as uh, James said it is now uh, a part of the uh, Bank of Japan uh, fiscal, uh, monetary policy talks. Hmm. When people talk about quantitative easing, you know, it's, it's similar. They're actually buying and selling um, corporate bonds and, and equities as well. So they're trying to influence long rates across the board. Yeah. What kind of inflation controls would uh, be in line with modern monetary theory? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Of course, our major inflation control is the job guarantee. Um, and the reason for that is because if you're investing in infrastructure and public investment, you can reach a point where you start running into bottlenecks before you achieve full employment. And that's because you're creating jobs and you're creating capacity, not where the unemployed reside, but where the unemployed do not reside. So you can get inflation creeping up before you achieve full employment. So. The job guarantee doesn't have to be large, but it's important because it takes over responsibility for creating employment opportunities for that small group of people. They might be in remote areas, so we had the Community Development Employment Scheme for Indigenous communities, for example. Um, when I was you know, a young uh, university graduate, we had the uh, Red Scheme, uh, and I was employed you know, chopping trees down around reservoirs and. Um, laying down a pavement along uh, Henley Beach Road in Adelaide and um, uh, laying down automatic sprinkler systems in uh, Tevin and Oval. Um, and these were all worthy community projects that were funded uh, at, um, well, around the minimum wage by governments to overcome the unemployment problem. And they were quite successful. The Bureau of Labor Market Research did a review of those programs and found that they were quite successful just before both the Bureau of Labor Market Research and the long-term employment programs got chopped <laughs> by the government. Yeah. Well, let me comment on one thing. Basically, why uh, certain tasks can only be undertaken by the government, not by private sector. And it is about, let's say, long-term investment in uh, research and development. Because private sector entities will not take losses. Mm. It is basically, we, if we look at the space program, the US, which is a very good example, the American government pumped enormous amount of money onto the space program. But if we look at the return on investment in the long run, 
It was tremendous. But it, was, it happened many years later, and all these technologies like GPS, for example, mm -hmm. they are a result of this initial investment. So it's not only, so, so basically, no private enterprise will plan invest, investing in so long horizon. And there's another question of, of so-called intellectual, intellectual property rights, because a lot of this investment in research and development creates public goods in, in the, in the, in the, copy, the uh, sense of knowledge which is shared between, between, between nations. Mm -hmm. so, so, so this investment, which happened in both uh, the Soviet Union and the US, actually resulted in improving technology everywhere else. Mm -hmm. And basically, the, the, the technology we are using right now is unfortunately, unfortunately a result of arms race during Cold War. Hmm. Now, can it, be, can it be sustained by private sector? And in the end, in the US, they, they thought that, say, 20 years ago, yes, big corporations like Google, like Microsoft, would spend enough, or Tesla, for example, they would spend enough in research and development. But it turns out that the Chinese way, where the government spends, not for the sake of making profits, but because they want to grow the country, it seems that it is working far better than the, than the Western approach, the neoliberal approach. So, so basically, this is a fundamental question. Why we need to have government spending mm -hmm. if we want, for example, to, to, to do this green transition? Because none of banks, none of private enterprises will spend enough money in developing technologies in this initial phase, but it's not profitable. It will become profitable in 10 years' time, but this, this entities will be long uh, gone. But the government will not. One of the problems with capitalism, which is a fundamental flaw in capitalism. Um, just going, going back to before, the, the job guarantee, mm -hmm. um, is that to prevent uh, the government from going too far and just blowing money and trying to get unemployment down to half a percent or whatever? Is that just to eliminate unemployment? Or is it, how, how does that prevent or would you need incomes policy or that kind of? Oh, it's not. You you can have an incomes policy alongside a job guarantee, but um, it, it may be enough just to have the job guarantee because what you're doing is well, there are two things. One is you're creating a pool of people who are work active rather than unemployed. Yep. So as the private sector recovers, they can attract employment from the job guarantee pool by offering better wages and conditions and career opportunities. Yep and training than you get in the job guarantee pool. Um, another thing is you're providing jobs at the minimum wage, so that's why the private sector might be wanting to pay more. And you're also offering jobs that aren't going to directly compete with the private sector. And that's why you tend to get flows out of the job guarantee pool into the private sector as it recovers. Now, another cause of inflation, of course, we had the two oil shocks. Yeah. And one of the problems is when you get cost push inflation as it's called, as it's called that can cause a, a wage price spiral. And it can do so under conditions where you've got workers and, and capos, if you like, bidding for shares of the pie that don't add up to one. They add up to more than one. Okay? And so what happens is the initial inflation that's triggered by uh, cost push, when you're importing, say, higher oil at higher prices can give rise to a bit of an inflationary spiral because the workers try to maintain their share of the pie, firms try to boost profits and maintain their share of the pie. So that sort of explains how um, cost push inflation can cause an inflationary spiral, but uh, a job guarantee can be one mechanism. Of course, in a job guarantee, you, you're taking workers who were previously in high wage jobs in the <coughs> private sector and you're employing them at the minimum wage. So it acts as a, a damper on inflationary pressures for that reason. Is the minimum wage still supposed to be a living wage? Absolutely, it has to be um, a living wage, um, definitely. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> one of the fears, of course, is that a job guarantee will be used to undercut public sector wages and undercut living conditions for the unemployed. But the red scheme never operated in that way. And I don't think the I mean, if governments, conservative governments, want to undercut public sector, they've got many instruments at their disposal to do that. They don't need a job guarantee to do that. So 
my experience was that during the early 70s, the red scheme operated, you know, to provide the unemployed with work opportunities, and it didn't directly compete. Uh, I mean, a lot of the work was with local councils, and it was work that the councils themselves wouldn't have been able to afford without federal government support. So. Uh, yeah, well, the thing in America, of course, is they want the job guarantee to probably perform too many roles, including as a vehicle for boosting public sector activity and, and, and wages. And, you know, and, and Bill in the Adelaide conference was trying try to clarify the difference not between. Necessarily a bad thing. No, in, in the American context, it isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, but, you know, it's just important to realise that if you view the job guarantee as a price stabilisation, or anti-inflation scheme, then it ought to be viewed in that light. And there are probably better ways of improving conditions in the public sector, not least going out there and spending a truckload on you know, public infrastructure and renewable energy, uh, microgrids, I mean, all these things that we want to see more of. A uh, very fast train network you know, connecting Melbourne and Brisbane all that would be a really good start. All that spending is going to cause inflation. Sorry? All, the, all else being equal. Hmm. Yeah, all else being equal, not when you've got unemployment, underemployment, and underutilisation of capacity, and not when you've got a, a, a public infrastructure that's falling apart, so we can't maintain. I mean, you know, we've said that derailment of the XPT between Sydney and Melbourne. Climate change ignores the wealth tax. Anyway, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. And I was in China in November last year, and um, you know, I travelled from Nanjing to Dalian, which is about 1,600 kilometres, all around the Yellow Sea, and uh, yeah, 310 kilometres per hour, and um, it was just so uh, impressive, you know, looking at the infrastructure that they've got provisioned. And every major city has a metro system now that's state of the art. It's a sort of Hong Kong style, where you know the the gates open before the carriage doors open. You know, there's a train every five minutes in Nanjing, you never have to wait. Uh, their, their metro systems are remarkable. And, you know, we're in the dark ages, you come back to Australia, and it takes me almost three hours to go from Sydney to Newcastle, you think. Yeah. Boy, oh boy. civil rights movement because he was fearful that it would split the Democrats in half, you know, between yeah, them. <laughs> yeah, and it was LBJ who actually yeah. in introduced most of the social improvements in America. Yeah, it's a crazy so system, isn't it? So, hmm? so near and yet so far. Yeah. yeah. Actually, just on Adam's uh, comment, um, one of the chapters in um, Marianne Mazzucato's book on the entrepreneurial state is on the iPhone and um, Stephen Jobs, because you read all these popular books, <coughs> Stephen Jobs, the child genius, you know, the great inventor, and she points out all the data grants that funded, you know, the smartphone, the flat screen, and all the components that went into the, into the first iPhone. You know, they were publicly funded, most of those uh, yeah. inventions. I like a new book, The Value of Everything, uh, that came out, she came out here to Australia, mm -hmm. a year or two ago, and we saw it down there. Okay, it's really, yeah. It's really written by Laura Tinker. Mm. Um, yeah, it, was, it was quite a good presentation. It's a very dynamic presenter. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> there was another paper by her and uh, Bill Lasnik, who's one of my favourite sort of business theorists. And both of them are available on the Levy Institute uh, website, if anyone's interested. And um, they're worth reading. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Is there, are there any other questions? <laughs>
This um, sort of bushfire, post bushfire funding, having a combination of the state and national government paying for is that basically the, what's what's the motivation uh, by the government to do that? Well, I think they're trying to. It's an issue of coag, isn't it? A question of you know responsibility. Where should the weight of responsibility fall in managing? the bushfire process, which doesn't appear to be particularly well managed at the moment. And we know in New South Wales they haven't been funding parks and wildlife offices. They've been reneging on, on burnbacks and keeping brush down and that sort of thing. So yeah, it's highly problematic. And even the other thing at the state level is you've got this big bun fight between the rural fire service and the metropolitan fire services and issues of unionised, professionalised firefighters on one hand. As cities have been expanding, they've been swallowing up rural fire services that haven't been transformed into metropolitan. And that issue you know, split the Victorian government. There were factions within the Labor Party that were trying to undermine the, the Premier uh, on that basis. And also the, the Liberal Party promoting volunteerism and using that to undermine you know, metropolitan fire services. So it's a very Maybe big you issue. Don't understand the fact that the monetary no, not at all. That's right. Well, they must. I mean, you've got to I mean, they must, therefore. Oh, did you? Yeah, chuck it back to you. Oh, just to go to China, mm. and thinking in, like, the sectorial balances, mm. how does the government's balance sheet look for the overall economy? Oh, yeah. And where did, um, how much would they be contributing to the overall economy, and are they spending it? Uh, in the lines of like Marion Mazzucato, where they're pushing in R and D, yeah. just using the fast trains for uh, um, as an example. Yeah. And does that are they a good MMT role model for what government should be doing? Well, apart from the, the, <laughs> the downside of the politics. No. Oh, putting yeah. politics aside. Yeah. I, I can, can I can I comment on this for China? Yeah, sure. All right, so what they're doing is uh, obfuscation because what happens is that they're blowing a huge private sector bubble. Basically, bank, people borrow from banks and spend money, okay? Yeah. And uh, they are supposedly privately owned enterprises, which are obviously controlled, which, they, which then spend money on R&D and borrow money from banks. And, but if we look at the balance sheet of the central government, yeah. it looks uh, it looks pretty neoliberal. They they, pretty, they don't run uh, big deficits at the, the central level. But province governments go and borrow money from banks. All right. But now now this is the interesting bit because it is not what we think. All the banks are owned by the government. So what they are doing, they are, they are doing exactly the same thing, but which is completely, which is completely hidden. And there was, there was, uh, there was, this information was actually on Reuters blog very long time ago. I, I unpicked it, I put it on the Reuters blog comments. So basically they, they say one thing because they don't want to upset the Americans and whatever, but they do something completely different. But now what happens if private banks are go saying, bankrupt? Are you saying that the government are actually got their own private banks in the economy? No, all right? the banks are all the banks are state owned and they can operate as zombie banks with negative equity, which ha what happened after the financial crisis of 1997. Nobody cared about it because you cannot get the government of the bank to go bankrupt. Because the because what it means is that your de your your deposits are safe. Yeah. That if you want to withdraw a de de deposit, you do it is guaranteed by the central bank, okay? Yeah. But nobody cares about the real Position of the banks, they can live with negative equity. So, so they are saying that China is going to implode because they have a huge housing bubble. Whatever, yes, they can implode, and so what? Nothing will happen because they are not privately owned bank, and then they will not cause the same problem as in the US. Okay. Oh, so they're not behaving like our capitalist society at all. With government, they do and they don't. It is much more yeah. complex. It's yeah. much more complex yeah. because it, uh, on the surface it might look like. No. Uh, this 19th century capitalism, okay? No, right. Exploitation and all of this. Yeah. And they're pretty brutal. But, but in the end, they have centrally planned economy, no, and right. they do something completely different, and they still teach Marxism. So they operate at very, if you, okay, let me tell you something. 
Mm. I was reading this stuff in English, all right? Yeah. Then I switched to a Russian version, and it was a completely different story in Russian. So what I did, I do translation. Fair How does the government go with who's doing all the R&D? Is the government doing the heavy lifting with education and R&D? In China? In China, yes. yes. I was very much driven by the Chinese Academy of Science for all the STEM activity and by the Chinese Academy of Social Science yeah. you know, for this geography is, and yeah. arts and humanities. And then they spend a lot of money yeah. in R&D and R&D corporations, so like you are. And then Americans accuse them of, yeah. of, that, of government subsidies. This is the worst thing, is that the government is subsidizing the, the R&D activities of, of so, supposedly private corporations. Could well, the know. Americans can also do the same, and they're in fact doing they this do. by, mm -hmm. by, by spending them. money on military. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So if you if you go to, to Chinese websites and use the Google Translate, you can read what they really write. And it's completely different from what they are because it is for it is for, for us who are unwashed who cannot understand the real language. Not more because I was born in this I know how to read So I know how to read this stuff. And yeah. first of all, read Russian. If you can read Russian, read the Russian version, which is different to English, and then read the Chinese version. Mm. Uh, all, all three different. Absolutely, this one truth is for, for, for Americans, for the Westerners. There are blogs, whatever, you will see people threatening tomorrow is going to be a financial crisis, whatever. Read the Russian version, they say everything is harsho, and then you go to, and you obviously they talk about great friends of Russia, whatever, and then go to the Chinese version. It is readable when you do Google Translate. And they say, and, the, the standing committee of, set, of, set, of uh, Politburo, whatever, whatever, decided to, to do this and this and this and this, and the next day we are going to do this and this and this. It's, it looks exactly like stuff, uh, you know, from the Politburo of uh, Polish Communist Party. That is the only difference is that these people in Poland were morons, while these Chinese are not morons. They know that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, on that note, <laughs> <laughs> one more question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> really, they lie to all the time. One of the most confounding things about MNT mm. seems to be, and partly I think it's terminology, mm. the notion of the job guarantee. Right. Now, neoliberalism says we've got this natural rate of unemployment, let the chips fall where they may. Mm. If firms lay people off tough shit, you're all unemployed, you're all in a powerless situation. This hopefully, from their point of view, makes wage push inflation unlikely to happen. Mm. Yes, is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, you can still have price inflation under those circumstances, can't you? Yes. That's correct, okay. So that's the way neoliberalism likes to depress wages in any case, yeah? Mm. A very brutal, a very cruel process that mm. keeps workers under the thumb, it makes everybody paranoid. It's just a horrible bloody way to run the show. But it's also destructive of productivity. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. However, mm -hmm. we then come to the MNT concept of the mm. job guarantee, mm. <coughs> which, as Mr. Mitchell pointed out, is a quite different animal mm. from the normal process of simply spending money into the public sector or one of its publicly controlled offshoots, you know, like a university or something, mm -hmm. and creating jobs directly by direct public employment that way. Yeah. Then we have this third entity and it's called the job guarantee. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not quite so understanding mm -hmm. of the manner in which that job guarantee acts as a price anchor. Does it do so simply by saying, here's the minimum wage and that's part of the package deal. Mm -hmm. And if we've got a lot of people dropping out of even the public sector or the private sector for some reason, instead of being cruel to them and leaving them with nothing, we're going to give them a sustainable wage and a role in society. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we're doing it in a situation where employment's dropping for whatever reason, is that what stabilises your prices? Precisely, yeah. You're no. getting people flowing no. out, of, out of the private sector, no. at high wages, no. into job guarantee jobs at the minimum wage, all right? And then that's when the private... That's where this minimum wage aspect of it, I think. I'm struggling to kind of see how that... I think I've 
I did it. I've got it, haven't I? Yeah, you've got it. And the crucial thing is that they work ready, they work active, they haven't suffered from all the, the you know, the, the stain of being unemployed, the loss of confidence, the loss of skills, you know. I mean, a lot of computing skills, for example, if you don't use it, you lose it, and you can lose it quite quickly. You might be able to build it up again quickly, but, you know, you can go back to confidence. it's hard, too, when you're trying to explain this to people, mm. especially when I had a Barney with somebody at work who saw a Stephanie Kelton video mm. and told me I was talking through my head and regions because <laughs> Stephanie says that everyone's going to have a job and everybody's going to have houses, and then she was equally convinced that everyone would have a UBI as well, so they could all be... Um, for artists or some bloody thing, at which point I can't work like that. <laughs> but can you enlighten us a bit about the way in which the job guarantee notion has been expressed in American context or how they might implement it? Because you said that it was a broader concept over there than what we've been hearing. Yeah, I think one of the problems in America, they don't have a national wage fixing system. They don't have award rates, you know, quite the same as we do. And their federal system gives much more authority to the states. So it's very fragment, fragmented and piecemeal. And conditions are much better in, say, California than they are in, you know, Colorado or somewhere like that. And that's what makes it uh, so difficult. And we have a very regulated uh, system of uh, grants, you know, the Commonwealth Grants Commission. <coughs> sort of allocates funding between the states and for a long while it was quite progressive because it recognised that the population dispersion, population density in states varies and states like Northern Territory, South Australia, you know, have problems because of uh, the dispersed population uh, and that has to be taken into account. So, yeah, I think our system is quite different. So they're trying to use the job guarantee really as a sort of a, an umbrella for a lot of public sector um, job creation that is not strictly of a job guarantee type. So they're not creating just jobs that are going to be um, in areas that won't directly compete with the private sector. They're going to be you know, a wide range of jobs and they're going to have normal public service conditions. Yeah. But that's um, like a way for them to get around maybe some stigma against public sector jobs or something? Would that be why the NMT is there pushing that wider version of the job guarantee? Yeah, I, mean, I suppose there's lots of stigmas in America, aren't there? And, and the whole idea of the Green New Deal was they're associating, you know, the new uh, um, renewable energy sort of economy with low waste and high recycling with, with you know, desirable public sector jobs and the job guarantee is the sort of vehicle, you know, that convinces people they don't have to worry because we can fund it, we've got the resources and so on. Yeah, so I think you just have to be cautious, yeah. I'm still wrapping my head around this one. I'm a little bit not quite gelling mm. with the concept of the job guarantee. Yeah. Obviously, we want people being employed to do sensible and socially useful things. Mm. And Mr. Mitchell has suggested that this is best implemented at a local level where you can go straight to the heart of the matter. Yeah, but funded by the Commonwealth Government. Yeah. Yeah. And that, to me, doesn't quite gel or sit with the notion that these very activities would be best um, catered for higher up the pole by simply normal public sector employment. So this is where the job guarantee and your normal public sector employment, yeah. to me it doesn't, there's something not adding up here. Because you also said earlier that when people drop out of the private sector, mm. they might be, you know, reasonably highly trained and yeah. I can't really see how the job guarantee in any logistical fashion can cater for those sorts of rather specialised workers. Certainly to keep working and to be keeping useful, mm. but I'm just hearing a couple of things loaded into the job guarantee concept that to me don't quite line up with other things that have been said. Now maybe I haven't understood it, or maybe there are some sort of slightly inherent uh, arguments that can be had to and try. Yeah, I mean, you, you there's some like of that, that, but I think the, the fundamental issue, if you think of the job guarantee over the business cycle, so you might have a period of very high unemployment and then a period of low unemployment, then the job guarantee pool during the period of high unemployment is going to be larger, and during the period of low unemployment is going to be smaller. But you might still need a job guarantee pool during good times because there are going to be people 
who just won't be taken up by the private sector, they might live in remote rural communities, there just aren't the job opportunities for them. That's why you need a job guarantee. And then in the downturn, obviously there are going to be more people who can be employed under a job guarantee arrangement. But also, ideally, you can invest in public infrastructure, you can invest in training, and you can do all the good things that you want to create to transform the economy in ways that you think it needs it. So, I can think of little thoughts about that exact objection that was kind of raised before, right. of the notion being misused in some way to kind of get down to the lowest common denominator, so mm -hmm. to speak, instead of spending properly on public sector employment in the normal fashion. Yeah, no, no, you want the job guarantee to be small under normal circumstances. Look, for 25 years, our own employment rate. Right. Is, um, if MMT is a theory that is neither right nor left, so to speak, like right, if you were to, is, it, is, is the job guarantee, shall I put it this way, a desirable left wing addition to MMT, or is it something that Mr. Johnson, with all his fiscal spending, that he's doing at the moment, he's fiscally spending, right? Yeah. Could he just ignore that and, you know, go for the natural rate of unemployment? Well, it comes back to How this issue that in the theory, in you're going to run into inflation bottlenecks before you achieve full employment. Look, okay. I'll just let this chap ask the question yeah. again because he's been uh, seeking yeah. Santa for a while. Just a quick one. Is income policy and stockpiling raw materials, and is that recommended by MMT? Uh, I mean, an incomes policy is something that we had, you know, during that period, during the start of the Hawke Keating years. Bob Hawke, when he was president of the ACTU, wouldn't do the same thing for uh, the Whitlam government at the time. But when he became prime minister, he managed to get the ACTU to agree to it. Um, can you combine an incomes policy with a job guarantee? Yes, you can. Um, is it? Desirable? Is it a good thing? Um, is it something that would be necessary? Not, I don't think it would, but um, you know, I'm not sort of disposed to <coughs> it in principle, personally. I mean, something you could ask Bill. Um, and perhaps we should probably leave it there, do you think? Yes, yeah. yep. So the thanks for sticking around for the amount of time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.